Hi, I'm James. And I'm Anthony. And this is Words and Numbers. Where we ask every week Anthony the same question and receive a variation on a theme soon thereafter. What's new and exciting in your world this week, Ant? Well, see, this is great because if you find this boring, I get to blame it on one of our listeners, Brian Roberts, who wrote in this week. Brian writes, Dear Anthony and James, I had a great moment with my sons yesterday on our drive home. We were listening to this week's episode, and you guys were talking about Amazon and monopolies. In discussing why you weren't worried about Amazon as a monopoly and how the market would regulate them, James said, quote, like Walmart and Sears before it. My son Jack says, what's Sears? Case in point. Here you go. <laughs> right. right right there. It was perfection. I said, exactly. I quickly explained Sears and Roebuck as a catalog store and then a massive department store, how it had been the go-to place to buy lawn equipment, tools, appliances, clothes, and whatnot. While explaining Sears and talking about why it fell, I stealthily shifted over a mile and took us to the mall where a massive portion is now all but empty. I told them, there, that's Sears. It's now a huge section of the mall with discount operations trying to hold on. We carried on to Walmart near our house to pick up some stuff, and I pointed out the massive addition they're building. I explained they are building out many of their locations to focus on warehousing and delivery for their online sales to compete with Amazon. In the end, I said that one day they may pass the massive Amazon Fulfillment Center north of Tulsa and tell their own kids about this website from which, once upon a time, you used to buy almost everything. <laughs> Brian, thanks for listening and sharing our podcast with your sons. We're happy to have prompted that excellent conversation. It is, I think, just about a perfect sort of thing, isn't it? Is that beautiful? <laughs> I have to tell you, I got more than a couple of emails in the past week calling me an idiot for saying that Walmart was on the decline. And, you know, people would say it's fine here, it's fine in my town, or, you know, it's doing this kind of online business. Fair enough. I don't think Walmart's in any danger of disappearing soon. But it will. But it does not dominate the market anymore. Yeah, you don't hear what you heard constantly five, ten years ago. Anytime someone brought up the topic of monopoly, it was always Walmart. And the question, what are we going to do about it? Walmart's becoming a monopoly. It's putting mom and pop shops out of business, all this. You don't hear that anymore. In fact, you hear it about Amazon. <laughs> That's right. And you're going to hear it about whatever's next, yep. too. And I have no special knowledge of what's next. Matter of fact, it's hard for me to imagine what's next. Although Amazon was hard for me to imagine once upon a time, too. And that's the beautiful lesson to central planners everywhere. We're experts in this area, and we can't imagine it. And if we can't, the politicians can't. So best leave it to the marketplace. Entrepreneurs will figure it out. Consumers will judge what's best, and it will float to the top. Not only can I not figure it out, I don't have the first clue. Right, yeah. And you think about these politicians getting ready to mandate USB-C on every device. I'd really like to see what comes after USB-C at some point, but now you never will if these politicians get their way. I have been vaccinated four times against the COVID. Yep, same here. Four. And if they came out with a fifth, I'd be down there tomorrow to get that one too. And I'm sure there are a number of our listeners who are saying things like, yeah, you don't need to drink the Kool-Aid, buddy, and things like this. And maybe I don't need to drink the Kool-Aid because our fearless leader, Joe Biden, also vaccinated four times, has gotten COVID again. He got COVID a second time. You know, you would think that if you had been vaccinated four times and had it once, you might not get it again, but you could be wrong. And, you know, I was thinking about this the other day when COVID was first in the news back April, March, May of 2020, the media was losing their minds about COVID deaths. You said, stop and think about this. How many of you know anyone who has had COVID? And back then, the answer was pretty no. much nobody knew anybody had had COVID, right? And now today, I think virtually all of us know at least one, maybe multiple people who have had COVID and recovered. Not to say everybody's yes. recovered 100%, that's not true, but almost everybody I know who has had COVID is perfectly fine. These are the thoughts you should have first. How many people do I know who have had X? Because if I say, how many people do you know who had a heart attack? Mm -hmm. Number is going to be very high. Yeah. How many people do you know who have any form of cancer? Number is going to be very high. 
okay, now we can back up again and say, all right, given that we all know a lot of people who have had COVID, the new right question to ask is how many people do I know who had COVID who died? That answer is vanishingly small. Whereas if you ask the heart attack question, going to be pretty high. And if you ask the cancer question, going to be even higher. So what do we do about it? Well, look, I don't know. I'm just offering a way to think about it. And Joe Biden's got himself case number two. I'm of mixed minds on this. I suspect that they would have lied to us about it if they could have figured out how to do that. I don't think you can hide him away for another quarantine period without telling everybody why. As you say that, the thought went through my mind. I wonder if they lied the first time. Because remember, Tr Maybe. Trump had it yep. and recovered perfectly well. You know, that would be a great story of how vibrant and healthy Biden is. And you and I have made it our life's work to discount conspiracy theories everywhere we see them. Right. <laughs> but, but, <yet>. but, <laughs> but lying and conspiracy theory are two completely different yeah. things. And politicians lie, every last one of them. Completing the syllogism, if Joe Biden is a politician, then he lies too. Which, of course, Aunt, brings us to the ever-popular foolishness of the week. I'm guessing that you won't even know who this person is, but let's give it a shot. Well, if it's a person in music or sports, I will have no idea. Some would say it's music. I wouldn't, but some would. Apparently, Beyonce released a new album. There was a backlash against her ableist slur. What's an ableist slur? There you go. Ableist is a thing that I don't even think we should be bothering with. It shows that some people are able to do things that other people are not. And the people in that second category, those who cannot, are what we would once upon a time called handicapped. Now, we don't use that phrase anymore. Do you know why we don't use that phrase anymore? No idea. It refers to a man with his cap in his hand begging for money. Oh, really? Handicapped. Enter the people who are offended by everything, and they were easily offended at that. So we started saying disabled. Right. Then that was no good, and they had to be differently abled. Yeah, that always struck me as strange. And at this point, we have no earthly idea what to call people who are disabled. But isn't that interesting? Because one of the premises in 1984 was that the government would architect the language such that it was not possible for you to have thoughts that the government didn't want you to have. Turns out the government didn't have to do that at all. This is exactly that. <laughs> That's right. The government didn't do it. We did it to ourselves. Yeah. I don't know what to call people who have various disabilities. You know and I know that I've got one. Should we talk about this for a second? If you want to, go ahead. Maybe we should. I've made no bones about it. I have Parkinson's disease, which is kind of terrible. I think that I am disabled. Why? Because I was once abled and now I am not. Right. Disabled. There's no slur there. That's just an easy way to refer to something that we see in our lives every day in any number of different ways. Right. So when Beyonce releases an album and she uses the word in one of the songs, spaz, Spaz is no longer to be used. Gee, I'd forgotten that word, but it was all over the place during high school, grade school. When we were young, yeah. that word was on the table. Do you have any idea what's wrong with it? No. Yeah, see, and that's just it, isn't it? We go out and we make these problems where probably none would notice, but the derivation of spaz is from spastic. Huh. And spastic refers to people or could refer to people who have epilepsy. I see, right. And therefore, using the word spaz is an ableist slur, which Beyonce is now going to go back and edit out of her recent record, and then we could all get the updated version later. But this is kind of horrifying. You know who this never bothers? Hmm. The people they're trying to protect from it. You know, that calls to mind a story. Early in my career, I was at a small college and one of my fellow faculty was in a wheelchair. And she and I happened to be on a committee during a committee meeting. And the dean was there. And the dean was big about language things like you're talking about here. And she referred to herself as disabled. And he corrected her and said, no, differently abled. <laughs> it's ridiculous. That's astounding. I just went to a big conference not too long ago. And I'm walking down the aisle with a cane the way I do now. And everybody's looking at me wondering what the hell's wrong. Hmm. And look, I'm a decent human being. I want to make them feel better. I don't want anybody to feel weird about it. Right. So I introduce myself now as a cripple, which I think is hilarious. 
it's absolutely hilarious, right? And yet people will correct me. They say, oh, you can't say that. So I'm pretty sure I can. <laughs> Particularly if you're referring to yourself. Yeah, no, that's right. And what am I trying to do? I'm trying to diffuse the situation. I'm trying to make everybody else feel better. Right. It's not about me. I know what I'm all about. I know what my problem is. It's about everybody else. That's what a considerate person does. Mm -hmm. The language police, the way they've set themselves up, I just can't take them seriously. Well, you said to me some years ago, it's really stuck with me, that in your estimation, one of the things that helped the gay community to integrate, to be accepted for who they are, is that they actually took what we would think of as slurs and laughed at them and used That's them on right. themselves, encouraged people to use them. So the word gay that once upon a time was a slur now isn't. And consequently, we don't think anything of it. I'll remind you of how black people reappropriated a word that was actually so bad I won't say it here. Right. But they use it all the time. And it's interesting, right, because when you see an outgroup, not to use a technical term, when you see an outgroup reappropriating the language that the in-group used against them in the not-too-distant past, you know you've got something going on that equals real assimilation because they can look at what happened to them in the past and laugh at it and say, well, that's just not the case anymore. And the gays are a very obvious example of this. They have had a tough run to become accepted. I'm doing some considerable work now in pop culture, so this comes up. But my contention is always the same. In order to be accepted, things happen in the background that most people don't notice happening. If you're watching TV and you stumble on a TV show called Will and Grace in the first year it was out, where two of the characters are out of the closet gays, one more gay than the other, the fact that that's on your TV proves all you need to hear. Because if it's on your TV, it's literally everywhere else. What does this mean for disabled people? I don't know, but I kind of run with a new crowd. Well, I walk and <laughs> hobble with a new crowd all of a sudden, and I haven't met a single one who takes issue with any word used to describe them by anybody else. Hmm. And I can tell you, we joke about this a lot when we're together in a room. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. You, when there's nobody else around, we're talking about this. You're talking about the word handicapped. We had our parish festival this past weekend, and uh, I happened to be out parking cars in the handicapped lot, you know, helping people come in, find parking places, so forth. And each person who drove in, because it was not clear what lot you were in, each person who drove in said, I'm looking for the handicapped parking. So all of the people there were using this term. That's right. Of course they were. Why wouldn't they? Yeah. It's a perfectly reasonable term. How is it derived? Well, I told you. Does it matter? I don't think so. I got my handicap placard for the car so I don't have to walk far. And that's really been a game changer. It's nice not to have to kill myself to get in. And the thing is, you know, I get and embrace the idea of not using words that are denigrating. But if the word started out as being denigrating and we've reached a point where no one can remember its derogatory roots, what do we gain by reminding people of this? And, you know, look, we often see this in racial terms, and, and I can tell you, that when I'm with other Irish guys, we call each other Mick. Mm -hmm. We use these terms all the time. When we do, there are peals of laughter. And we only use them, I think, because we know that there's no problem with them. Yeah, there's no malice. That's right. If these were the words that we're using to keep us from integrating, I don't think we'd be amused by them in the least. Right. But we've already integrated. You can't look around and say the Irish don't fit in. Right. There's no malice intended. There was once upon a time, but those times are long past. Nobody who uses these words means to denigrate me or my kind. Mm -hmm. I don't get angry about it. And I think every racial group there is would pick out a couple of words in their own past and they'd say, yeah, that this is about where we are with this one too. But this gets all the way to something I really love, Ant, baseball. I have a real love for baseball. I watch the Red Sox every single night. This year, they stopped referring to the disabled list, which you, know, you would go on if you broke your leg in a game or some such. And now it's the injured list. Yeah, I guess I'm all right with it, but I was all right with disabled list too. Don't know anybody who is disabled who looked at that and said, we have to change that. I kind of appreciate that they did it. It shows that they give a damn, right? And that's always the nice part, mm -hmm. that there are people out there who really give a damn. And then they use all kind of draconian measures to make sure you agree with them, too. And that's where it all kind of breaks down. That's where it falls apart. Right. Exactly. So uh, if you meet me, you can call me a cripple anytime you like. I think it's hilarious. <laughs>
I, I do. I think it's absolutely. I hilarious. called you a lot worse than that, uh, James. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you really have. And and when you call me those things, it's also hilarious. It's, it's kind of like when my dog looks at me funny. It's not like I can blame the dog for for having whatever thought the dog has, nor can I blame you. <laughs> to get more, Ant and James buy a copy of our excellent book, Cooperation and Coercion. You can find the paper and electronic versions on Amazon and the audio version on Audible. If you'd like to support Words and Numbers, make your way over to patreon.com slash wordsandnumbers, where you can contribute to our podcast-making habits. If you'd like to schedule us to come speak at your event, be it corporate or educational, or have James officiate at your wedding, send us an email at wordsandnumberspodcast at gmail.com. This week, we're doing something that we don't often do. We're talking about a shooting and guns more generally and this business that happened in a mall in middle America. Surely you saw this, or maybe you didn't. It made a bit of a splash the next day. Just about two weeks ago, yeah. A bunch of news stories kicking around, and then it disappeared very quickly. Isn't that something? Here's what happened. A guy, seemed to be a pretty nice regular guy, Elijah Dickin was shopping in a mall with his girlfriend and watched a guy emerge from a bathroom with an AR-15 in his hands. That man started shooting people as he came out of the bathroom, and he killed three human beings whose only sin that day was going to the mall. Elijah Dickin, from the minute he saw the guy get out of the bathroom to the second that he fired his first shot back at the guy, managed to get his gun out, push his girlfriend to the floor, telling her to stay safe. And then he fired 10 rounds at the gunman, hitting him eight times at a distance of 40 yards. Which for anyone who hasn't fired a gun before, and it was a Glock, a handgun, that is an astounding distance. If you go to a firing range and under the best of circumstances with your headphones on and everybody being calm and cool and collected, if you could put eight of 10 in a target at 40 yards, I tip my cap to you. Yeah. Think about the adrenaline that he had to push down just to do anything. Our first instinct when that happens is, can I get out of here? But oh no, not Dickon. He unloaded on the guy and killed him. And he wasn't an off-duty police officer. He's just a regular guy. He's a 22-year-old, I want to call him a kid given how old I am, but he's a 22-year-old man, no military training, no police training. It got reported that he took care of this in a minute or two, something like this. The chief of police came out and he said, no, 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 it took him 15 seconds and we think he's a hero. I think this was astonishing. Look, I've never met him. If he's listening right now, nicely done, young man. But I'm guessing he had a lot of range time to be able to do what he did. This would have ended up, well, I guess it is a mass shooting under the FBI's definition because there were three victims plus the shooter himself. That's four deaths. That qualifies as actually the FBI calls it active shooter. They don't use the term mass shooting. But here's the thing. The guy with the AR-15 opens up on the area of the mall where people are sitting having lunch, you know, the big food court. Food court. If this guy had not taken him down, the shooter would have ended up killing dozens of people quite easily. It was a catastrophe as it was. But imagine if he was given another five minutes or if the recent school shooting is any indication if the police just surrounded the mall and waited for him to run out of bullets. Right. Because that seems to me to be what they were doing in that Florida school, which have two, three hundred police officers could have been there at any point in time, but they didn't do nearly as well as one human being who was in the right place at the right time. This event occurs and it shows up on the media. I did a search of how many times the word shooting showed up in Google searches around that period and before, and then compared that to other times when there have been mass shootings. There was a spike in the number of people looking this up, so you knew the people were out there looking for it, but it wasn't nearly as large of a spike as you see in other events. And I think what's going on here, people will tend to say that this is clearly cherry picking on the part of the media. They're going to show you the shootings where people die. They're not going to show you the shootings where the good guy with the gun takes out the bad guy. I've got the New York Times open on my desktop, and while they did cover the event, They had a very curious paragraph right in the middle. 
It is exceedingly rare, the exception rather than the rule, Adam Skaggs, chief counsel and policy director at the Giffords Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence, said of scenarios like the one in Indiana. The reality is that more people carrying guns means more conflicts escalating into deadly violence and more people being shot and killed. So what does the Gifford Center say in the wake of this heroic act? Well, we don't want this to happen much. We don't want anybody to have guns. And look, I get it. Kathy Giffords was seriously wounded by gunfire in a place near where I sit right this second. I expect her to think that way. But I don't expect the New York Times to pull this kind of I saw a statistic saying that the number of times in which a good guy with a gun has taken out a bad guy with a gun is something in the order of one-tenth the number of times that the bad guy with the gun come into mass shooting. I can't say whether the statistic is correct. I'm just saying that I've seen it. But what the statistic does do is it ignores the number of times that somebody with a gun stops a shooting without shooting the shooter. And that's exactly what gets on my nerve when you say the thing. Because every grown man knows the most terrifying sound in the world, apart from his angry wife, is the sound of a shotgun chambering a shell. Click, click. And every time somebody hears that, they run. Why? Because they're about to get destroyed. A lot of people for home protection will keep a 12-gauge around. I think that's perfectly reasonable. I might or might not have one myself. But the sound is, I think, the thing that gets most people to go away. It's not the shooting. The studies that I have seen indicate that more people prevent crimes by simply brandishing a gun than are caused by bad guys who have the guns. Yeah. If anyone listening is interested in seeing more detail on this, we have an entire chapter of our book, Cooperation and Coercion, dedicated to this topic. Yeah. And you'll find lots of citations of the data there. And let's be honest, in that chapter, when we're thinking about what gun policy should be, there's no clear answer. That is correct. We looked at states with very heavy regulation, states with almost none, heavily populated areas versus rural. There's really no way you can look at any of the data that we share with you in the book that would say, okay, given the data, this is the correct policy. Right. I can say, given the Constitution, this is the correct policy. But the data just don't support much of anything. The only thing that does come out from the data is that states and localities that have higher concentration of gun ownership also have higher concentration of suicides. What is it? Two thirds of all gun violence in the United States is actually a suicide. Yeah, two thirds of it. When you get that data that say this many people died as a result of gun violence, it's not gun violence in any way that we would understand what the noun violence actually means two-thirds of these people, and it's typically, what, like 30,000 people a year in the U.S., if memory serves? I think it's like 32 or 35, somewhere in that range. So 20,000 of them are suicides. And those people, not necessarily, but probably, would find a different way to kill themselves. Now, it's interesting, right, because we've got an example of a place where the method of suicide was taken away. And this is in Great Britain, when they switched over from coal stoves in the kitchen to cleaner burning gas stoves. People used to kill themselves in the old days by shoving their head in the oven. But when those stoves disappeared from England, the suicide rate went down immediately. But what I never would have expected and what did happen was that the suicide rate stayed down. Yeah, it didn't return as people found alternate ways. Suicide, generally speaking, is a one minute decision. If you can get somebody to just stop for a second or two, They may think better of it. This is why people get talked off bridges. They think they're going to jump. They get out on the ledge and then somebody says, hey, you know what? I can talk to you if that would help. And all of a sudden, there's a better answer. The argument you and I never make is that if we banned all guns tomorrow, we wouldn't see a drop in the murder numbers or the death numbers. We might see a downtrend in suicides. There are good reasons to say, let's get rid of all the guns. To me, I don't think they make enough of a compelling case to do it, but I get it. People point to Australia when they're making the argument you're making and say, well, Australia banned 
whatever banned rifles. Let's be careful. I wasn't making that argument. I was presenting that argument. The argument you were presenting, yes. I don't need the hate mail that's coming <laughs> because of that. Let's just stick with the regular hate mail. But people cite Australia with its gun ban, and they actually went and confiscated guns and destroyed them, this sort of thing. And what happened is, if you track the data, which, again, we show in our book, Cooperation and Coercion, you do see a decline in homicides by gun, but you also see a corresponding increase in homicides by knife. Now, the increase in the homicides by knife is less than the decline in the homicides by guns, so you could point to the whole package and say, okay, in total, this was a good idea, except over those same years where the United States did not ban guns, the gun homicide rate in the U.S. fell further than it did in Australia. So how you explain this, I don't know. But this is not evidence that somehow the gun ban did a good thing. It's not evidence that it did a bad thing either. It's just inconclusive. We should make the point that gun violence in the United States has declined 77% since 1993. We're down 50% since the 1990s, and that's gun homicides, and gun violence is down like 80%. And when you ask people, they think it's this unbelievable social problem that we must address this second. Where were you in 1993 when it really was? And that brings us back to the media. I want to cut the media a break here because one interpretation of what we observed, which is lots of coverage of the mass shootings and not so much coverage of this good guy who takes out the mass shooter. One way to interpret that is cherry picking, that the media has this story it wants to get out that guns are bad. And so it's going to sit on the story where the guns were good and promote the story where the guns are bad. And that's one interpretation. There's another interpretation here that's more favorable to the media, and that's simply an observation bias. That is, when the bad guy shoots a whole bunch of people, that's remarkable news, and so it shows up in the media. When the good guy prevents the bad guy from shooting a bunch of people, you don't have a bunch of dead people. Well, in this case, we had three, but you don't have dozens, and so the tendency for this to garner media attention is somewhat lessened. I understand why the media does what it does, but there should be enough self-awareness there to figure out what actual stories look like. This was an astounding story. And how on earth could any journalist look at it and say, well, nah, I'll get something else. There's a detail to the story we haven't hit yet. Well, two details. One, Indiana went constitutional carry just 16 days prior Right. And this guy would not have had a weapon on him prior to that, I'm guessing. Yeah. So under constitutional carry, the idea is the Constitution preserves your right to bear arms. Therefore, the state is not going to require any licensing of you. If you want to carry a gun, you carry a gun. That's constitutional carry. So Indiana went constitutional carry just 16 days prior. But here's the really interesting thing. The mall had a prohibition against guns. Two guys violated that prohibition. Yeah, and isn't that interesting? I mean, the bad guy with the AR-15, of course he violated. It doesn't matter that the mall had a prohibition against guns. No, he was showing up to kill people. But what the prohibition might well have done is prevented the good guy from carrying his gun there. Now, thankfully, he ignored the prohibition. We told the story of a shooting at a Luby's in Texas. Yeah. A woman went there with her parents, and they were eating at a Luby's. Luby's didn't allow guns in, so she put hers in the glove box, went in to have lunch with her parents, and both of her parents were shot and killed. And now she's left with their memory, knowing that she could have stopped it if she just kept her pistol in her purse. I mean, look, it's private property. If you tell me I can't have my gun there, I'm probably not taking it. Probably. But thank God this guy didn't pay attention to that sort of thing. When I got here to Tucson... I asked what the gun laws were, and people said there aren't any. <laughs> they said, right. you got to be kidding me. And they said, no, no, whatever you want is fine. Carry it anywhere you want. Open carry, concealed carry, doesn't matter. Whatever you like. And what do I never see here? Problems of gun violence. I don't walk down the streets here thinking, I'm going to have to shoot these people. It doesn't happen. Now, do we have gun violence? Yeah. Is it proportionate to the population here? Yeah, it seems to be. One of the things we like to do on Words and Numbers and when we write for newspapers is to encourage people to have constructive conversations about topics like this. In my observations of conversations about guns between the pro and the anti sides, 
it seems to me that there's one thing that stands in the way of them having civil conversation. And that is that the pro-gun people are constantly, and I think rightly so, but they're constantly calling the gun control people to task for not using proper nomenclature. The not using the proper nomenclature clearly illustrates that they actually don't know what they're talking about. That's correct. And in defense of the gun control people, I suppose that they see that argument as splitting hairs. It's not splitting hairs. Well, I'm saying they see it that way. I agree. What they hear is that the pro-gun crowd wants to drill down into some esoteric conversation, completely missing the point that there's a gun and it killed somebody. We need to do something about that. Now, in defense of the pro-gun crowd, when they hear the gun control people use incorrect nomenclature, what they hear is somebody saying, look, I want to ban this gun and I'm going to define it so loosely that years from now we can take this law and apply it to all sorts of other things that I'm promising you I don't intend to ban right now. I get the sense that that's a major point of disconnect. I hate to pick sides in this, but I think the onus here is, as you pointed out, on the gun control people. Learn the nomenclature if you want to have a constructive conversation about this. And the pro-gun people are not looking to go down a rabbit hole. They want to understand what is it precisely that you want to ban and why. You keep using nomenclature. I would go so much further. I don't think this is a nomenclature argument. I think this is an argument about the nature of things. And I don't care what we call things if we all call it the same thing. And when I see these arguments by the anti-gun people, oh, it's an automatic weapon. Hmm. Well, no, it's not. It's almost impossible for anybody in the United States to own an automatic weapon. It costs a lot of money. You need a special permit. That permit isn't given. That's just not the issue. What they actually want to talk about are semi-automatic weapons, which... They want to ban more often than not, not realizing that the vast majority of all guns produced are semi-automatic. Right. All it means is that you can squeeze the trigger one time, get one shot, and then squeeze it again and get another. There is nothing magical about this. And the people who claim that this is what they want to get rid of, they have no idea what they're talking about. You can't. It would be like getting rid of televisions. How the hell do you think you're going to do that? One thing that would be useful is that when someone calls for some regulation in the wake of a shooting, demonstrate that this regulation, had it been in place at the time, would have prevented the shooting. Otherwise, the pro-gun people, all they hear is that you're using this as an excuse to push through legislation. They did have legislation. They had the so-called assault weapons ban. What's an assault weapon? There's no definition. What did Congress decide? It decided that anything that looked scary in particular ways qualified as an assault weapon. You're not exaggerating here. No, that's exactly what happened. They were literally talking about things you attach to the gun to make it look scary. Yeah, so it's a heat shield, a pistol grip, right? these sorts of things that don't alter the nature of the gun in any appreciable way. Banned an entire class of weapons, and it lasted for, what, 10 years? When this percolates into the conversation now, I put up a picture of what used to be an assault weapon next to what is a ranch rifle, the kind of thing that you shoot squirrels with. They are exactly the same gun fundamentally. They shoot the same round. They shoot it the same way. They shoot it at the same velocity. Everything about these guns is the same except the way they look. And here's the fascinating part. Gun violence was already going down when this ban went into effect. It kept going down throughout the entire time the ban was in effect. And then when the ban disappeared, it kept going down more. Right. That ban had nothing to do with diminishing gun violence in the United States. Something else did, and I don't pretend to know exactly what that is. It's probably a bunch of different things. I think the the ban did have an effect. And that effect was to get a bunch of politicians elected to Congress. Yeah, mission accomplished. Because if you think this through, on both sides, the politicians for and the politicians against, they both benefit by this problem remaining unresolved. So long as the gun question is unresolved, they can both use it election after election. Everybody thinks that every question is a technical question. That if we just move the levers a certain way, everything is fine. That's demonstrably not true. 
And here's how you know. Think about every presidential election cycle in your life that you can remember. Now think about the issues that they argued about in the debates and what have you. You see, every four years, the exact same things come up, Mm -hmm. which means that neither of the parties can figure out how to fix that. They say they're going to, and then they don't. Sooner or later, you have to say, maybe there's no easy solution to this problem. Mm -hmm. When people say honest things like that, I love listening to what they say next. That's all we've got this week on Words and Numbers. Be sure to join us next week when we talk about something, you know, at least marginally more uplifting than this nonsense has been. Until then, follow us on Twitter, where Ant is routinely criticized on the one hand <laughs> and <laughs> edited on the other or censored. <laughs> well, it's not like you were censored. They just attached a note to your idiotic tweet. <laughs> anyway, you can join us also in the Words and Numbers backstage group on Facebook, where the conversation continues. We'd love to meet you there. Have a nice week. And Ant... I hope all is well in your corner of the universe, and and let's all try to be nice to each other. I'm going to try. I'm going to try really hard this week. How about you? I'm always nice, James. It's often the case that imbeciles are always nice. (laughs) (laughs) We'll take it up again next week. Have a good weekend. See you next week, James.